Greetings everyone and welcome back to another in-depth phone review. In today's video we are taking a look at a phone that I've always wanted to take a look at since I'm a fan of phones with physical keyboards, especially the BlackBerry Priv, that is one of my favourites. But this one is from a company called Unihertz and they have created the Unihertz Titan. And it's been on the market for almost two years now but it offers everything that a late BlackBerry device would offer, plus it's also rugged. So it's got a lot going for it. And since BlackBerry is no longer in the phone market at the moment, hopefully it does get revived one day, Unihertz has stepped in and filled that gap. They've also released a smaller version of this called the Titan Pocket, which if that was available or would have opted for that, but instead we have the massive tank of a phone to look at in this one. This phone was sent to me from Banggood, so a massive thank you to them for sending it over to me. I really do appreciate it. This was meant to be part of Black Friday sales, and depending on when this is uploaded, the links in the description should still be available. By December 1st, I think they won't be valid. So if you want to check them out and get some neat dealios, feel free to check out those links. And if you are interested in the Unihertz Titan itself, the link Links are down in the description below. They are affiliate links though, so if you do purchase one using one of my links, I will earn a small percentage of commission. However, there's no obligations to click them. If you want to hop onto Google and have a look for one, that's no problems at all. And besides, if you go to the actual Unihertz website, you'll find the Titan's actually cheaper on there at the moment. I'm not too sure if it'll jump up in price in December or not. I'm not really too sure on that. So the Black Friday links aren't affiliate ones, but for the Titan, they are. So I hope that makes sense. And I'm also not being paid by Banggood or Unihertz for this review and all opinions within this video are my own. Since I go very in-depth with my videos, there are timestamps in the description as well as the pinned comment to skip to wherever you need to be. I'm fairly sure at this point in time they come up as chapters, so hopefully YouTube will integrate them. I understand the length of these videos can be a bit much at times. Seeing one hour plus on a video makes people really frustrated, but going in-depth as much as I do does take a lot of time, so please feel free to use those timestamps if you need to. Currently, the Unihertz Titan is on sale on Banggood at the moment for $520 Australian for a limited amount of time. I'll display the currency conversion chart on screen for you all, so you get an idea of how much this rugged BlackBerry inspired tank costs. As I said, you can go directly to Unihertz to find the Titan for 339 US dollars, which I'll display a currency conversion chart on screen for you all once again, but I'm not sure if they deliver all around the world, but you do save about 40 US dollars going through their site. I'll link that in the description also, so feel free to take a look at that if you want to. There are some accessories available for this device, but unfortunately there are no bundles on Banggood available for it at the moment. And you do only get the essentials in the box, but judging from the build of this, I don't think you'll need a case. It does have screen protectors already applied, so that's more than enough. Anyway, so let's go over the specifications of the Unihertz Titan to learn more about what you are getting for the money. The front of the phone is protected by Gorilla Glass, but the version is not specified. The frame and back are made of a combination of plastic and rubber. There's also a metal camera housing and metal side rails. It is IP67 certified, which means it's water resistant, dust proof, and shock proof. The dimensions of the device are listed on screen, and the weight of this is 303 grams it is a hefty device. The system on chip is the MediaTek Helio P60. It is an octa-core processor and is based on a 12 nanometer manufacturing process. It also has a Mali G72 MP3 GPU on board. The RAM configuration sits at six gigabytes. The internal storage is 128 gigabytes and has support for a micro SD card. Up to 256 gigabytes should be fine. The display is a 4.6 inch 1432 by 1436 IPS LCD with a one by one aspect ratio. And for an Android device, this aspect ratio is definitely strange. However, However, it manages to work really well for the most part. Camera wise, we just have a 16 megapixel rear camera with autofocus, which is capable of recording 1080p video. The front camera is just an 8 megapixel one with fixed focus and can record in 720p. Both cameras do not have any optical image stabilization, only electronic image stabilization. The battery in this is rated at 6,000 milliamp hours. It also has 18 watt fast charging as well as 10 watt wireless charging, which is good to see on this device. The OS is Android 10 and is fairly stock for the most part. Unihertz has added a few extra applications and some changes to the user interface, but that's about it. The original OS on this was Android 9, so depending on where you order this from, you may get it with Android 9 or Android 10. My unit has Android 10 out of the box. Now, one of the main selling points of this device is the physical QWERTY keyboard on this phone. The keyboard also doubles as a touchpad and has a capacitive home button that also works as a fingerprint sensor. There is also a customizable side key for assigning shortcuts for media and keyboard functionality. For audio, we do have a 3.5 mil headphone jack, which is great to see. However, this only has a single loudspeaker in installed in it, but I can tell you that it's very loud and pretty good for what it is. Our connectivity options are on screen. We do have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.1, GPS, a bunch of sensors, and we also have NFC on this device. Coming to the networks, this should support most major networks around the world, and I'll put the band list on screen for you all, so feel free to pause the video if you need to. Please make sure that you check with your network providers to make sure your country supports these bands. I have tested this with Vodafone, and I've had a very consistent, strong 4G signal. The SIM card tray will have the option to have two nano SIMs with dual 4G standby, 
or one nano SIM and a micro SD card. In the box we get the phone itself, an 18 watt fast charger which depending on where you order from should be the correct plug for your country, Type-C USB cable, earphones, a plastic screen protector, quick start guide and a warranty guide. And that is all the specifications for the Unihertz Titan and when it comes to the advertising we don't really have much. It's pretty much just this banner, just showing the phone in some water and then a feature sheet showing the device in various scenarios and some quick specifications. One thing to note is that this device did have a successful Kickstarter campaign and it seems a lot of people are happy with this device. So the question is, is a rugged phone with a physical keyboard relevant in 2021? almost 2022. Let's find out and unbox the package and start taking a look at this Titan of a unit. Okay, and here we have the package here, which has bang on it. Goods over there somewhere. At least they have their own packaging, which is kind of nice. This took about a week to get from China to Australia, which is not too bad. So we'll go ahead and crack this open and have a look at the Unihertz Titan. Now it does feel like they've put a travel adapter in there, so we'll take a look. Now I've got to say that this box has heft to it. Alright, there's the travel adapter, and there's the Unihertz box, which I don't know if you can see, but it looks like some water has gotten into it, because the box is actually quite wet. It wasn't in the rain, so I have no idea. Uh, hopefully it's all still good then. Unihertz on the front, very plain looking box. We've got the Titan on the side with Unihertz stickers. Same on the other side. On the bottom we do have the dual IMEIs, and the quick specs that we've already been through. Slicing through the stickers. Let's take a look at this rugged, Blackberry-inspired device. So we have this little cardboard insert, which probably just has the instructions and quick start guide. Oh, it has a uh, plastic screen protector to apply. Unfortunately, I'm terrible with applying these, so I'll probably just leave it off. Hopefully there's one already on there. And we do have the quick start guide, which, yeah, it's, it's wet. I don't know how this happened. The package wasn't wet from the outside. It wasn't in the rain, so it was probably from the factory where they've stored it. I don't know, confusing. Anyways, uh, I've got a couple of the stuff on there. Programmable key, fingerprint home key, microphone, volume key, power key, front camera, indication LED. All the good stuff that we've been over in the quick specs, and we do have a warranty guide as well. Sim eject tool is just there as well. Titan itself, which we'll come back to in a second. Under this, we do have a European charger just there, which does support all the fast charging capabilities of this device. You get a Type-C USB cable, and we also do get some earphones, which are very Apple inspired. So they're looking very earpod like but the button actually has Unihertz printed on it. Let's take this absolute unit out of its bag. Now this right here, my friends, is a very interesting smartphone. It is actually a bit bigger than I originally thought. I thought it would have been maybe the size of the BlackBerry Priv, which is just here like so. I thought it might have been sort of, you know, kind of like that, but no, it's a bit wider, much like the BlackBerry Passport. This is what this is mainly based off. Okay, so we're gonna remove this before using. I shall do that. There we go. Once again, apologies for the audio in that previous bit and for this jump cut as well. So I'd already switched this phone on, had a bit of a play around with it, and then I stopped filming, checked the footage over, and yeah, the microphone was just all buzzing and all that sort of stuff. So that footage is kind of unusable now. So I'll do it all again. But this time it's gonna be a little bit faster because I know a couple of things about this device already. So straight off the bat, holding it in the hands, it feels extremely nice. It is a very thick device and durability wise, I don't really want to drop this because I kind of want to continue using this. I'll tear it down and submerge it in water, but I don't think I'll do a drop test on it. This phone has been out for about two years, so I'm fairly sure people have already done in-depth reviews, but I'm just doing my take on this. I've also removed the screen protector because I tried pulling it off and unfortunately both layers came off at the same time and then I tried to put it back on there was air bubbles, so don't worry about it, it's all good. We've got a sensor at the top, the earpiece, the Unihertz logo in this metal badge just here, the front 8 megapixel camera, and the keyboard, which actually does feel quite nice. The shift and the alt buttons are in really strange locations, so if you're wanting to sort of go shift and then start doing that, you kind of gotta, yeah, it's a bit weird. And this is pretty much gonna be used as a two-handed device. You could probably one-hand it, possibly. Realistically, you wanna go with two hands here. Unihertz has already released the Titan Pocket, so if this thing a little bit too big, you might want to check out the Titan Pocket. Banggood didn't have that available, or else I would have picked that, but instead I've got this, so let's concentrate on this. But yeah, we've got the recents, home button, and back. That's our fingerprint sensor just there, which does work well, but I'll show you that as well. The microphone is down at the bottom, and the keypad also doubles as a
as a touchpad. Around the device with these metal sides, we've got the SIM tray as well as the programmable key. At the bottom, just our Type-C USB port. On the other side, we've got our power key and volume rocker. And at the top, we have a headphone jack. This phone does pack quite a lot of features. It is a bit pricey, yes, but a physical keyboard, wireless charging, NFC, IP67 certified, it's got a lot going for it. We've got a 16 megapixel rear camera as well as our LED flash encased in this metal housing once again. The back of the phone is made of rubber and these pieces are also made of rubber. Unihertz logo, once again, an inner metal badge. Dual speaker grills, but only one speaker is installed in this. I will go on the assumption that if this was to be dropped, it would likely survive because the screen is quite embedded within this thick top piece as well as the sides. So if this was dropped accidentally, it would likely survive, but drop tests aren't really everything. They can't be very conclusive. Some phones can just keep going and going and going. Some phones, one drop, that's it. They're completely dead. So that's really why I don't want to do a drop test on this because if it cracks instantly, then I can't really continue using it. But judging by its weight and heftiness, I think it'd be no problems there. Removing the SIM tray, we do have an option to install dual nano SIMs with both running at 4G or a micro SD card and one nano SIM. I'll install a Vodafone SIM because this doesn't have 5G and a micro SD card. And just to know that the SIM tray also has a rubber ring around it for the IP67 certification. Powering on the absolute titan of a phone that this is, here we go. Now this is already running Android 10, which is good. Originally it did ship with Android 9, but this one is already upgraded to Android 10. And since I've already played around with this, I have received two updates that have improved the security patch level. Um, I will check that once we get into settings. Here it is booted up and straight away the four by three aspect ratio screen just throws me off completely because I'm just not used to it on Android devices. I'm used to 19 by nine aspect ratios now, but I can tell you that the screen is super clear for what it is though, but we'll take a better look at that soon. We do have 4G already. And one thing I did forget to notice when I was initially testing this was that the keypad has a backlight. It's a bit dim, but it's not too bad. In dark environments, that'll be more than enough. So I'll set up everything now, put my email in and all that sort of stuff. If you do want to type in numbers, this is what happens. So you'll get a number row on the screen, but of course you can use the keyboard to type in numbers if you need to. So typing on this keyboard, I actually think I'll be able to get the hang of this. It's just pretty easy. You know, sort of, I know where the keys are, but it's just physical keys for me are just so strange. But here we are. If BlackBerry was continuing to make phones, we may have something sort of like this still. I mean, this is essentially a BlackBerry passport, as I've already said, but of course it's running Android and is more up to date. Now, see, if you want to use the symbols, you can do the on-screen ones or just Alt. There we go. That's it. I will do a proper typing demonstration later on. So I'll set up fingerprint while I'm here. So even with just a small real estate on my thumb, it does seem to recognize it. Not all the time, but if I used my actual finger exposed, then it'd be fine. And this does look like BlackBerry OS X inspired, especially with the wallpaper. Now this is a bit of a strange one, but by default, you actually have navigation gestures on screen. So for example, there it is there. So you could use that if you wanted to. If we opened up, let's just say settings, you can use that to go back or you can use the keypad to go back. You can't actually have on-screen buttons. You rely on the navigation gestures as well as the buttons, which is not too bad. It would have been cool to have an option for just on-screen buttons there, but I guess it could make things a little bit more finicky. And since Android gestures are my thing, I'm gonna be sticking with the keyboard. As I've mentioned in the specifications, this is pretty much stock Android. There are a couple of apps that have been added by Unihertz, such as Trackback, Toolbox, Game Mode, an NFC application, and a notebook app as well. But touching and holding on the main screen brings up widgets and wallpapers, so you can select your widgets if you want to. You can change the wallpapers. Now I'm not too sure where these are from. Someone will have to let me know. I think that's from Apple, but I'm not too sure. They do look fairly nice though. Uh, we've got a Bugatti Varon, the Bugatti something. We have the moon, we have some sand and some uh, something. Fireball, a starry sky, Blackberry looking thing. Uh, oh, that looks kind of sick. That also Blackberry wood circle thing, I don't know. Another Blackberry inspired thing. Speakers working. Shapes, city, stripes, flowers, 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 uh, some sort of a Ferrari Enzo or something. Uh, Unihertz and Unihertz. So you do get quite a lot of wallpapers with this, but I think I'll leave it as the default one for now. As I said about the display earlier, it is very, very sharp and very, very nice for what it is. I mean, they could have went a bit ridiculous and put a 2400 by 2400 panel on here, but the 1426 by 1426 or whatever it is, is pretty nice for what it is. Swapping down, we do have all of our shortcuts here, such as NFC, location, screen recording, all that sort of stuff. We'll try the torch, see how bright it is. 
Not too bad. I will be taking some night shots with this to see how it performs. We've also got an underwater camera, scroll assistant, and the keyboard backlight, which you can toggle here. Also, at this point in time, if you press any of the keys, it will just bring up the Google app and you can start typing to search on Google. But let's jump into settings and show you the various features with this device. So within network and internet, Wi-Fi does pick up 2.4 gigahertz as well as 5 gigahertz. I'm connected to my 5 gigahertz network. Uh, we do have the mobile network, which does support Wi-Fi calling if you want to use that. Uh, we do have mobile plan on here, which I'm not sure if that's eSIM or not. I haven't really checked this out, but I will let you know if this is actually eSIM. I don't think it is. I think it's only just the dual SIM cards that you can put onto the SIM tray and that's it. There's also a couple of extra features in here, such as the network speed and some other settings. Connected devices, we've got Bluetooth and NFC. So at this point, we'll go ahead and test NFC. It should be located right about here. There we go. Right about there. May as well show you while I was charging at this point in time as well. So just put that on there like so, and it should start charging. There we go. We do have the notification LED up here as well. When we get to battery within settings, I'll splice in the battery standby information as well as the charging speeds. Before we go into apps and notifications, I want to give this a call just to test out the call quality. I will be recording this with my Blue Yeti microphone so it'll be nice and clear, but it may pick up some interference. The default ringtone of the Unihertz Titan is this. Testing the earpiece quality of the Unihertz Titan. This is what it sounds like. This is with 4G and I believe VOLTE on as well. Uh, but this is with Vodafone and it should sound fairly good. If you can hear Ripley crying, that's because she is. And the microphone quality on the Unihertz Titan sounds a little something like this. Hopefully it doesn't sound too bad. If there is any interference, it's because I'm recording with my Blue Yeti. So it's picking up possibly anything it can. From my brief testing of this, it's actually fairly clear and I hope this does pick up in the recording. And I will say the core quality on this is excellent. The earpiece is nice and clear as well as the microphone, so there'll be no problems there. Apps and notifications, there is quite a lot of them installed. I mean, I can just sort of scroll through here really, really quickly to give you an idea of just how much stuff is installed on here, but even with all this stuff installed, this is still quite a snappy device, performance-wise anyways, from the small amount of testing I've done so far. It's not laggy at all, so these are probably just default little things here and there. Uh, but otherwise, there is quite a lot of stuff. There's a Chinese app there as well. I may run the Secret Codes application just to see if we can bring up the MediaTek test menu. Now, Intelligent Assistance is the main customization menu for the keyboard. So you can swap the Alt and Shift key. So if you think that the Shift and Alt keys should be the other way around, you can swap them around. Ringtone volume increases gradually. You can do that. Block notice. Not too sure what that does. Uh, network manager, so you can choose which applications use Wi-Fi or mobile. So if you only want Chrome using Wi-Fi, you can just tap mobile off, so Chrome will be forced to use Wi-Fi for data. App blocker, which pretty much is self-explanatory. It'll block applications. Keyboard shortcuts, so this is where you can configure shortcuts. So you can assign shortcuts to any of the keys on the keyboard if you just press and hold them. So for example, if we press A, you can go to all applications, choose an application, set it there, press and hold A, and it will bring it up. There is quite a lot of customization options on this, and you can just do short press as well, where on the main screen, if you just press A, then it'll bring something up. LED notification, which I've already showed, is just located just up there. U cable, it does show battery voltage and battery current in here. I will try with the Unihertz cable and see if anything does pop up during the standby test, and I'll edit that in. You also do have scroll assistant. This is one of the things that I really wanted to see on this device, and that makes it where the keyboard acts as a touchpad, much like what BlackBerry had implemented in their later device. Devices. But I'll go ahead and leave this on because I'll probably end up using this most of the time because I found myself already wanting to do this when it was disabled by default. So now that it's on, I'll be using it during the review. Turn on screen for notifications. We do have mini mode, which if you do this and then swipe three fingers down, it turns it into that mode, which is sort of that one-handed mode if you wanted to use it like this. It's kind of handy if you do want to use this one-handed, but I wouldn't because of the weight and just how sort of wide it is. Rotation control. Now, rotation control on this device is actually quite important. When you open an application, for example, I've already installed Genshin Impact and tried it at this point in time. I'm filming this video all over the place, so don't worry. And I've opened it up and it was like this and I wanted to play it like that. So you have to go into it and select if you want the application to automatically launch whichever way, portrait, landscape, reverse, or you force it to be portrait, landscape, and reverse. And once I put force portrait on, it worked fine, but I did find a small issue with Genshin Impact, which I'll later talk about. But this pretty much goes for every application that you install on this device, such as, you know, YouTube, any games or anything like that. If you want to force it to be in portrait or landscape, whichever way you want, Rotation control is the way to go. Shortcut settings, the push to talk key, the programmable key, which 
you can program it to have control, symbol, magic key, and media key. So if you kind of don't like the shift key being there, then you can have that as the shift key while typing, which might make things a little bit easier. And then you can also do short press, long press, and double press for the programmable key. So once again, a lot of shortcuts can be done on this. The spacebar key can also be used to answer calls, hang out calls, and also take pictures. Flip to mute is fairly explanatory. You flip the phone and it'll mute it. And we also have a QR code scanner just on here like so. Continuing on to battery, we've got 56% left and should last to about 7.45 a.m., which is only about five hours away or so. The last full charge was eight days ago. Now, I did only have this on charge for about five minutes or so. When I originally powered this up and was playing around with it in the footage that was unusable, its last full charge was 166 days ago. So it's been sitting in a warehouse for 166 days, plus possibly more, and it was at 60% when I pulled it out of the box. So battery life on this, I'm gonna say is quite good, but I will splice all the battery information here for you all in regards to standby and charging speeds and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so I've had time to do the standby test and the charging test. So I left this for 30 35 hours and it dropped from 100% to 72%, which means the battery is going to hold up quite well in all day-to-day -day scenarios. And even while using this, the battery is holding up quite well. So that's one good thing with it. However, charging this back up, I used a Samsung 25 watt fast charger and it was at 72% and now it's at 94%, but I put that on charge an hour ago. So if it's going to take about an hour to get to 25%, that means it's going to take four hours to get to 100%. It may just not be working with the Samsung fast charger that I'm using. And you may actually have to use the OEM charger that's bundled with this, which does make sense, but I just thought I'd try it with my Samsung 25 watt fast charger and that's the results I got. It does say charging rapidly on here, which means that it's charging rapidly, but obviously something's not quite right. It is a 6,000 milliamp hour battery in here and also using MediaTek's fast charging capabilities, which may be a little bit iffy in that department, but I'll keep playing around with this and see what other results I get. And just another update on the battery. I tried the original charger that came with this and it would still take roughly about four hours to charge up to 100%. Being that this has a big battery in it that should last you more than two days, you might get it down to about 50% and then just chuck it on charge for the night and just leave it and then come back to it. But I also tried the U cable, which is right here. I put the battery voltage, battery current, miss notifications on, and I have no idea what this does. Nothing came up in settings or anything like that. I used the Unihertz U cable. Well, unless it doesn't come with the U cable, I have no idea. So we'll just leave this for now. In display is mostly all the usual settings. You can toggle dark theme if you want to. You can change the font sizes, the keyboard backlight, which can automatically adjust based on the environment, but I'd rather just have it switch on whenever you press the keyboard. For themes, you can also change the accent color, the headline or body font, and the icon shape as well if you want to. In sounds, we do have all the volume sliders, phone ringtone, is custom ones that Unihost has put on here, I believe. I'll just go and play a random one. I think these are custom Unihertz ones, but I may be wrong. Uh, alarms, dial pad tones, screen locking sounds, all that good stuff. Sound enhancement, so we do have best loudness, which is good to see on Android 10. I thought they may have got rid of it by Android 10, but nope. We've got best loudness still. Storage wise, we've got 128 gigs of internal storage. My SD card is also 16 gigabytes. Nothing really much to talk about within privacy. Location, I did use location beforehand in the unusable footage and did quickly open maps and it was able to find my location very quickly. So I'd say that GPS on this would be very good. It does also have a couple of other GPS features that were mentioned in the spec listing. So I think you will be all good in that regards. The security update is 5th of June, 2021, but the Google Play system update is the 1st of August, 2021. We do have screen lock already enrolled, but we do have the option for face unlock, which does look like the one that was on the S21 Plus Ultra, which I've recently just reviewed. But I'll go ahead and roll my face. This essentially just takes a photo of my face and uses it to unlock the phone, but we can test that as well as the fingerprint now. So I'll just stare at this. Nice and quick. So this isn't a physical button. This is just a capacitive button there. So if I, there you go. That was fairly quick. Yep. And the fingerprint is also Nice and quick as well. Accounts just has my Gmail on here already. In accessibility, we have all the shortcuts, talkback, magnification, color correction, all the stuff that you require if you need any of these. Google services and preferences will leave. We do have system, which says key keyboard is the virtual keyboard because of it having that custom bit at the top there, it has to use a custom keyboard. You could probably install Gboard on here, but it would be on the screen. It won't be sort of just that little tiny area that this custom keyboard that they've put on here has. I will do a system update quickly just to check. But as I said, I've already received two system updates while using this device, but I don't think we've got any at the moment. No, we don't. And finally, within About Phone, we do have the Unihertz logo as well as welcome being signed in. I will try wireless update. This is where the uh, updates came through actually. 
Uh, but we're up to date. 21st to the 5th, 2021 is the security patch level, which is all just listed there. Baseband version, kernel version, build number, I've already put developer options on. And Android version, we can trigger the Easter egg if we want to. And there we go, there's your puzzle game. And that is pretty much everything within settings. So going back to the gestures, as you can see, it's implemented reasonably well, but if we go back into settings and I type in navigation, there's only the option to have gestures on. You can switch it off if you want to, or just have it on. I may as well leave it on. So at this point in time, the device is looking fairly promising, but I think we've got to really test the performance of this, camera, browser test, proper keyboard test, and all that sort of thing. Gaming-wise, we do have the gaming mode. But since this is a 4 by 3 aspect ratio screen, the games may be a little bit strange on this. So what I'm also going to do is throw an emulator on here, probably a Super Nintendo emulator, and try and use it with this keyboard and see how that fares out, because a lot of people have asked me to try emulators on these devices, so I will do it on this. But as we're starting to test the applications, I'm going to open camera up first. So here we go. There it is there. It's the... Standard MediaTek 1, pretty much. We do have normal, video, time-lapse, pro settings. I will leave it all as normal. But if we go into settings, we do have an EIS option. Picture size is 12 megapixels or 16 megapixels. We'll do 16 megapixels. Some extra shortcuts there as well. Okay, so in 16 megapixel mode, that's what it's looking like. So I'll probably leave it like that. Video-wise, for the rear camera, the video quality being 1440 by 1440. But you can also change this to 1080p, 720p, 480p, 288p or 720 by 720 which is good that it supports resolutions made for this display. EIS is also here. The video format is MP4 or 3GP. We're going to go MP4, of course. And switching to the front mode is nothing too spectacular here. Once again, you can film in 1440 by 1440 or 720p. EIS is also available for the front camera. There's no options for beauty modes or anything like that. It is fairly basic. But if we go to the options for here, picture size is 8 megapixels, anti-shake, all that sort of stuff. Mirror, we can have that on if we want to. So it's not going to be doing anything great in the photo and video department, but I'll go ahead and take some test photos and videos for you all, and we'll check over the photo and video quality of the Unihertz Titan and continue on with this review. Testing the rear camera quality of the Unihertz Titan. This is in 1080p. I decided against 1440p as I'll leave that for the front camera, but this is what it looks like. We can autofocus into the Froggos, and there's a bit of detail going on. It's not the sharpest camera in the block, but it will do. And my garden is supposed to be here today. Um, I'm hoping that's the case, but uh, close up on the flowers, that's not too bad. Three Muppets, as per usual, there we go. This is with EIS on as well, and it's a little bit shaky still, but it's not too bad. Walking along, it's still a little bit shaky, but it's not half bad. Brick wall, as per usual. Where's the bolts? There they are right there. Let's go in for a bit of a close-up. There we go. And there's Stuart in all of his morning glory right there. It is 9 a.m., and he's looking like that. Lemon tree, let's not even, let's not even just go there. <laughs> let's just ignore that. And then the faraway aircon with a four times digital zoom looks a little something like this. Looks a little bit choppy with that, but hey, this isn't meant to be a camera phone. It's meant to be sort of a business rugged phone thing. So camera wise, it's okay so far. All right, testing the front camera quality of the Unihertz Titan. This is in 1440 by 1440. I decided to do this mode because rear camera quality is going to be 1080p. So this is what it looks like. It's a uh, bit wobbly, bit of a sort of a jelly movement going on. Uh, no autofocus either. Uh, it is detecting my face, which is good, and then I go completely pale, and then all of a sudden I'll be 
having some sort of a skin tone again. Uh, look, it's not too bad. It'll do, but it's not the best, though. Boom. In a flop. There we go. Yep, always got a flop. B. All right, so you've seen the photos and videos that I've taken with the Unihertz Titan. All up, I can just say that it's not great, but it's not terrible. Is that quote still funny in 2021? Probably not. The front camera is average. The rear camera is not too bad. I did get some detail within a couple of photos, like the three Muppets. They look pretty sharp. The colors are a little bit washed out though, but autofocus was nice and quick. And while I haven't done the night shots as of yet, hopefully they turn out okay. And as I mentioned, there's no filters or beauty modes or HDR, anything like that. It is fairly basic for what you get. I mean, Stuart looks fairly clear just there and the bricks behind him uh nice and vibrant i mean they're a little washed out but look as i said they're not great they're not terrible they're average they will do so with camera out of the way let's go ahead and keep testing stuff out i've also installed my own applications at this point in time for testing so i've got call of duty a super nintendo emulator device info hardware san andreas geekbench 5 secret codes genshin impact and minecraft now i've tried the emulator and i've also tried genshin impact and i have found some problems but i will get to them soon going through the applications that are installed by default on the phone we do have a google folder which has gmail maps youtube drive youtube music google tv and photos i think we might do the youtube test first while we're here we may as well do it. I can actually play this in 4K 60 FPS. Well, I'll go ahead and do that and we'll put it in full screen, which is what it's looking like. What I showed earlier in the rotation controls, you have to go back in there and select an application in order to force an application to rotate a specific way. So fixing the rotation control, I can either have it like that or like this. Doesn't matter which way you have it. Honestly, it's going to probably be fine like this. That's 4K 60 FPS as well. Where's the volume? All right, let's be fair to it and put it to 1080p. Actually, 1440p. As I said, the display is very nice on this. I gotta give it that. And there you go, 1440p, 60 FPS, beautiful. That looks very nice, but you sort of wanna be watching YouTube videos like that, I suppose, on this. Once again, you've gotta go into rotation controls in order to get it to stay like that. No, that's actually quite fine. Speaker so far sounds pretty good. While this can't play 4K 60 FPS, it will probably play 4K 30 FPS quite fine, but 1440p 60 FPS works perfectly fine on this. But I suppose there's one good thing though, it kind of acts as a dual screen, so while you're watching the video, you can scroll down, keep watching the video as you scroll down past TikTok and see a bunch of other stuff that's been uploaded by other people. So that could work. YouTube music is up next, so we'll try the speaker test and see how loud this is. All right, with no sound enhancements on, let's try BFG Division at 100% and see how we go. One hundred six point eight. we got to. This is a very loud speaker that's in this. I would say it's probably a pretty beefy one. Probably takes up, you know, so much space there. A little bit distorted at 100%, which I guess is normal for most speakers when you pump them up to 100%. Too bad they didn't actually integrate dual speakers onto this unit because that would have been a bit of a benefit to this device. But for the single speaker in this, that's a pretty good result. And if you did turn best loudness on in settings, you'd probably get a slight increase with this. So we'll have to see when I put it in water what the speaker will sound like then. But it makes sense. It's a big phone. It's got a big speaker. Sounds good. So let's continue on. Duo Assistant Google Play Store. Ah, Play Store. I should actually mention something. I actually tried to search for Ark Survival Evolved and it doesn't come up. Now this has six gigabytes of RAM and the processor should be more than enough for this, but nothing has come up. Not too sure why, but I've showed the other games that are installed and I think that'll be more than enough to demonstrate gaming. Phone, contacts, Chrome and camera. So I guess we'll open up Chrome and do the browser test. Let's just say you've bought this device and you want to look up Unihertz Titan like so, there you go, and then you can just use that to scroll, which 
is nice and smooth. Oh, a little bit laggy here and there, but it's not too bad. So let's go on to Amazon, for example, and see what it looks like on this display. And I thought the aspect ratio may have been a little bit off for this, but no, it's quite fine. And of course, with the specifications of this device, you're not going to run into any lag or slowdowns with browsing the internet. Yeah, everything opens quite fast. And I do love the touchpad here because I don't need to touch the screen. I can just scroll down through here. The Titan Pocket does look really nice. And I'll see if I can get my hands on one. Now, if I swap it into this mode, there we go. And now I can scroll like this. So you could one hand it. I mean, if you wanted to and just do that, that's pretty cool. I would honestly rather it like that and just go ahead and scroll like this. You know, that's pretty nice. Browser wise, I don't think you'll have any problems with web pages being a little weird due to the resolution. And I have been using the browser while testing this device and I've run into no issues so far. Chrome on this is fine, nice and snappy and no problems here. So let's continue on. So we've got clock settings, sound recorder, calendar, emergency alerts, SOS and trackback, which is just maps. And that works no problems. And as I said earlier with location, it picks up my location straight away. That's nice and fast. So no problems there. Toolbox, we do have quite a lot of things in here, which as I've said for other rugged devices in the past, they should always include include this toolbox with all these applications because people that are looking for a rugged device are likely going to be using some of these. So it's good to have them pre-installed by default instead of having to go out and find your own. Heart rate, place your fingertips on the rear camera to start testing. Okay, let's try this then. I'm a little bit stressed. So let's see. Let's see what it comes back with. Okay, well, accordingly, I'm dead. Oh, there we go. No, never mind. Uh, 75 BPM. I'll take my finger off the sensor and see if it does it. Oh, no. Okay. So I've got to cover it again. So let me try it again. Okay, so it's 90 BPM. Probably not the most accurate thing in the world because it's using the rear camera, which I don't recall any devices using a rear camera to actually test your heart rate, but it may have just passed right over my head. Magnifier, which you can magnify stuff like so. Let's get an old SIM card. Hey. That's not too bad, actually. Meanwhile, that little SIM card is right there like so. See, you don't need a dedicated macro camera and stuff. The main camera on most phones is completely fine. Manufacturers, stop putting two megapixel depth sensors and macro sensors on phones. It doesn't make things any better. Just have a good main sensor and an ultra wide or a telephoto. We'd be happy with that. So that's Toolbox. Install by default, very handy for people that will need this. Now, game mode is here, which game mode is pretty much just turn off all notifications so you can play games on this, but it doesn't improve performance or anything like that. It's just a thing to turn off notifications and that's it. Now we've got NFC card emulation up next, which if I add a card, let's see if I can rewrite the NFC on this. I don't think I can, but hey, you never know. I've tried it a bunch of times. I'm not too sure what I'm doing. Maybe I need to have empty NFC tags in order to use this. That would make sense. We have student mode up next, which is basically just parental controls. Calculator, FM radio is up next, and we need to test the 3.5mm headphone jack. We'll go ahead and see what's on Australian radio at 4.22pm on a Tuesday afternoon. It'll most likely be the stuff that they play when you're coming home from work, which is upbeat and happy music to make your day better. Yep, you always guess free willy, and then last week we gave it to you. It's not free willy, is it? Uh, to go to a guest for mine, no, it's, it's not free willy, is it? No, it's Australian radio absolutely sucks, but FM radio works, which is good. Sim toolkit, Google files, as per usual, keep notes and notebook are the last applications. So I'm going to open notebook and I'm going to show you a full typing demonstration with this keyboard. So we can have it as test. Now this will be timestamped in the description below. So if you're specifically looking for where I type on the keyboard to show how it properly works, then here we go. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Now, if we then press enter, we can then do shift and do hello, or if we want to do, uh, hey, how are you? And then exclamation mark. Number wise, if you press alt twice, you can then go ahead and use your numbers. Press alt again twice to then go back to using the normal keypad, which once again with shift, you double tap that to then type all in caps. As I mentioned, they are in a bit of a weird spot. They're usually supposed to be, you know, here somewhere, but don't forget you can customize this key to work as the shift key or the alt key if you want to. And while you're using the physical keyboard, you do have this small little window, which comes up with text prediction and basic symbols and stuff. I mean, a dedicated number row would have been okay, but I'm pretty happy with just using the alt key and then pressing the number keys like so, or you can open it up on the on-screen keyboard and type in numbers like so if you want to. So plenty of options here, but for the 
keyboard though, while I'm not completely used to it yet, it is fairly responsive. The space key I feel is a little bit too small because sometimes you're clicking B and V instead of the actual space bar itself. But for the most part, the keyboard feels like it's lifted straight from a Blackberry, which it pretty much is. It's very responsive. It's got the touchpad, the capacitive home button, which doubles as a fingerprint sensor and has your number keys and symbols and all that good stuff, which is the main selling point of this device is to have a keyboard on a rugged device and it is very well implemented. But otherwise, that's the keyboard demonstration. Okay, so we've pretty much looked at all the default applications. So now I think it's time that we move on to gaming, emulation, specifications, and benchmarks. But the first thing I want to do is open up secret codes and see if we can find any hidden codes on this to open up to maybe do the test menu or something like that. Uh, we do have aging test. Doesn't work because your device isn't compatible. But we do have aging test, app IMEI, CIT test, device properties, device property, device property, device property, engineer mode, face unlock, factory tests, a heap of them actually, memory tester, null settings, oh, Chinese application. We'll try that actually. 22, hash star, hash star. Okay, you can increase the brightness of the LEDs, I think. I don't know what that says there. If someone in the comments can let me know, that'd be really great. 4636, uh, yep, usual testing. Memory test, RAM tester. So you can test the memory on the phone, which is six gigabytes. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that's my thumbprint. Huh. That's pretty nifty. Don't steal my fingerprints. What is this aging test? Check the need for the test item and then click the start button for testing. Okay, so pretty much just testing all the main features of the device. Okay, well, I've had a bit of a play around with some of these and majority of them work, but I'm fairly confident that there's no dodgy stuff on here. So that's going to be all good. I'll link this application in the description below because it's really handy to see if your device has any secret codes that you can open up within dialer and test certain functions of your phone. Just be careful with some of them as messing about with the wrong settings may result in your phone being bricked. Well, on cheapo devices anyways. On legit ones, I think you'll be fine. Now, before I open up Geekbench, I'm going to open up device info hardware, just to confirm the specifications with everyone. It is the A-Gold Titan, not the Unihertz Titan, it's the A-Gold Titan. And I messed up earlier with the resolution. It's 1432 by 1436, MT6771, 7, 7, Android 10, bunch of sensors just there, six gigabytes of RAM. The system on chip is the Helio P60, as I've said in the specifications at the start of the video, which is not the greatest system on chip on the planet, but for a device like this, it'll be more than enough. Manufacturer appears to be A-Gold. I'll Google A-Gold and see what that comes up with. Screen is 1440 by 1440, but it is 1432 by 1436. The aspect ratio is 9 by 9. I thought it was 4 by 3. I have made several mistakes then. That's okay, I'll edit those mistakes out. And the multi-touch test for the Unihertz Titan, I think is 10 point multi-touch? It should be. There you go. 10 point multi-touch. Memory, 6 gigabytes of DDR4X, 128 gigabytes, and as well as my 16 gigabyte SD card. Camera, 16 megapixel back, and 8 megapixel front. Nothing new to see here. The battery says 6,230 milliamps is the power profile. So it'll be interesting to see if that's the actual case in this, or if it's just a 6,000 milliamp hour battery inside of this. And sensors, we do have everything but a barometer, if I've pronounced that correctly. Specs all check out here, no problems with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up Geekbench 5, and we'll run this and see what we get. I'm not expecting a very high score, but I will compare this with a couple of other devices that are around the same price range, just as a bit of a reference. So we'll be right back. And the test results are in. We got 299 for single core and 1455 for the multi-core score. I'm gonna display other Geekbench scores from previous phones in the past on screen for you all. So the Blackview BL5000, which is currently about $400 Australian, that got 539 and 1651, and that was a gaming phone. The Poco X3 NFC, which is about $350 Australian, got 566 single and 1668 multi Multi. This phone's currently floating around for about $500 Australian. So granted, it's not the best in the performance department. I mean, it would have been fantastic if they threw a Snapdragon processor in this, but unfortunately they've had to go with MediaTek and it kind of does show. However, numbers are just numbers at the end of the day. And from my experiences using the device so far, I've had no performance issues. I think it's quite a snappy device and it's a pretty good performer. If we now go to games, that may change. So as I said, I've got Call of Duty, San Andreas, Genshin Impact, Minecraft, and a Super Nintendo emulator. So the first thing I wanna do is show you the Super Nintendo emulator, which I've already set up. So I've put some ROMs on here, which I won't talk too much about ROMs, but I do own the physical copies of the ones that I've put on here. But you can go to the key and gamepad setup and you can auto detect the device and it auto detects the keyboard. Then you can go into there and assign all the keys you want to. So I've kind of got a bit of a weird layout here. So for example, that's all my keys there. Like up is W, right is D, down is X, A is left, 
all that sort of thing. It's a little bit strange. Now I will try other platforms, but this video has already gone too long. So I'll just show Super Nintendo emulation for now. And this is Donkey Kong Country on this. So that's, hang on. So that button and that button. Okay, off we go. Uh, is it select? There we go. Now I can play as Diddy. Well, you won't be able to speed run games with this keyboard. It's more than enough for emulation, as long as you don't mind the weirdo sort of key locations. Um, but yeah, you can play this quite fine. I wouldn't mind playing this. I used to play Donkey Kong Country on my N-Gage, which was a bit difficult. But it's good to know that it runs pretty much flawlessly. And due to the screen being the aspect ratio that it is, it works quite well for Super Nintendo. Alright, go on, let's try Super Nintendo Doom then. It's still amazing to me that they were able to port this to Super Nintendo, but here we go. We have Doom. Now I think... Okay, so I've got Eleanor as strafing. Yeah, it's a bit difficult, but... It's playable. Uh, I don't remember the button. I'm stuck on a wall, I'm stuck on a wall, I'm stuck on a wall. Get out of the way, get out of the way, Amp. Get out of the way. I'm almost dead. I don't know how I managed to get... It's okay, I died. But anyways, you get the point that Super Nintendo emulation works pretty well on this. You just gotta play around with the keyboard and set the controls to something you're gonna be comfortable with. But for games that rely on shoulder buttons, it might be a little bit difficult. But NES, Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, Master System, 32X, all that sort of stuff. Load them up all on here and here you go. Then again, this is a $500 device. You don't wanna buy it specifically for emulation when you can get emulation devices for about a hundred bucks that will do exactly the same thing. Next up, we'll try San Andreas. As you can see, this is what's happened. So I haven't turned the rotation control on as of yet. So what I've got to do is go back to settings, intelligent assistance, go to rotation control, go to San Andreas and set that to false portrait. Now, if I then go back to it, there we go. I'll go ahead and set this up and we'll see how it performs. Okay, it looks a little bit cut off, which I think that's gonna be the problem that I'm talking about with Genshin Impact. All right, so we'll skip that and here we go, so, all right, um, can't use the touchpad to do anything. I can't do anything with the keypad. So we're gonna have to stick to on-screen controls. All right, to be fair, it runs fairly well. I didn't expect this to run any different, but I thought maybe we could use the, the keyboard to maybe control. Whoops, that was my bad. Uh, I'll see if I can set up the controller actually. I'm not too sure if there's an application available for Android that you can force keyboard inputs to be used in games, but if we just go off using touch controls, it works quite fine. It really does feel weird looking at it like this, but it's playable. No sweat. And there probably will be some other issues like images being cropped for this display. But otherwise, San Andreas works fairly well, so we'll move on. Minecraft looks a little something like this, which once again, I've got to do the rotation control stuff. All right. And hey, nice and smooth. That's pretty good. Once again, the aspect ratio is throwing me off, but honestly, I could probably get away with playing this. It's not too bad. Can I use any of... Oh, I can actually use the touchpad to navigate through here, but can I... Aha! There we go, but I can't move. I mean, I could use one hand to be controlling the camera and then the keyboard to be controlling the movement. So you can use the keyboard with this and spaces to jump as well. No, the other buttons don't seem to do anything. There's probably bindings that you can do for this. That's nice and smooth. The phone is getting a bit warm at this point in time, which is normal, and it is quite warm in my office at the moment, so that's kind of to be expected. If you don't mind it being a little bit sort of squashed together and a bit narrow, then uh, you'll be fine with Minecraft. Now we've got Genshin Impact and Call of Duty last. Now I'm gonna show you Genshin Impact. So I set this all up, I let it download the 13 gigabytes of additional data, let it all install and everything like that. I had it to the side and I let it play that first cutscene, and then it looked like it was frozen. And I thought, what's going on here? So I reopened the game, tried it again, and I'll show you what happened 
happens. So at this point in time, you have to select a character. So go and select a character, and you're supposed to type your name in. Unfortunately, you can't do anything. I've pressed every button possible, and I can't do anything. If I touch the screen, it just goes straight back. If I select the other character, I then cannot do anything. So it is possible that you could probably set up a controller and get past this stage, but Genshin Impact at the moment is not going to work, unfortunately. I don't know a fix for this, but if you wanted to play Genshin Impact on a Unihertz Titan, nothing's stopping you, but you just won't get that far, that's all, unless you do some sort of mad hacks and try and get around this. Last application to test is Call of Duty. So let's fire this up and see how we go. So with Call of Duty, I've bumped the graphics up to the absolute maximum that I can. I've already done the tutorial level, and that was actually very smooth. So I'll show you the multiplayer. You can see that we've kind of got about that much of the screen missing on that side, and yeah, that missing on that side. The good news is though, is that it runs extremely well. And this is on all high settings. Uh, Anti-aliasing is on. Uh, everything seems to be pretty much on maximum. So I'll just go ahead and just shoot an opponent. There we go. Uh, I'll just walk around and keep doing that. This is an online match. So if you do have an online match, it'll probably get a little bit laggy. Uh, in that department. As a quick demonstration for Call of Duty, I don't think you'll have any problems with this. Once again, you can't use the keyboard to perform any actions. You'd probably have to yeah, get a third party thing to bind the controls to that. But if you just use the touch screen, it's quite fine and it's perfectly playable. Gaming wise, emulation seems to be the better option for this, I would say. But with Call of Duty, San Andreas and Minecraft working perfectly fine, I'd say that most games should work well enough on this, it's just some things may be cropped out. But while we don't have the best specifications on this device, gaming-wise is actually quite acceptable. And as just a sort of semi-conclusion at the moment, I really do love this device. While I had some problems with the fast charging, the rotation controls can be a little bit iffy, and some functions you do have to play around with in order to get them working for your preference. If this had a Snapdragon processor in it, it would be absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, it's got MediaTek, but it's still a solid performer. I do love the keyboard. With its current price being around the $500 Australian mark, BlackBerry phones are also getting extremely pricey as well. Even the BlackBerry Priv, the Key 2, they're just going up and up in price because BlackBerry's not making phones anymore. So Unihertz has stepped in and said, hey, we'll slap a keyboard on a phone, make it rugged, waterproof, there you go. So if you do miss a physical keyboard and you can't get your hands on a BlackBerry, then this would be definitely something to look into. But otherwise, at this point in time, I've tested all the applications, most major features on this device, done a keyboard demonstration, call test, standby, everything that we need to do. So what I will do is a very quick durability test before I tear this down. Now I will dump this in water, but even though the ports are exposed, the USB Type-C ports exposed as well as the headphone jack, hopefully we should be fine. It is IP67 certified, so I don't think we'll have any drama but we'll see if any water leaks into the speaker and I'll be playing BFG Division while I submerge it. I know I said I wouldn't do a drop test, but I will just do three drops. While I'm at the sink, I'll just accidentally drop it from the sink to the ground and we'll see if anything happens. I'll do three drops and three drops only. And if it does break in those three drops, well, so be it. If it doesn't, fantastic. But as I said, drop tests can be very inconclusive because it depends on how it's dropped, how it lands, all that sort of thing. Some phones will shatter on the first drop, some phones will just keep going. So with it all working at this current point in time, let me go ahead and set up the camera near the sink and we'll continue on. Okay, we're here doing the durability test for the Unihertz Titan. It's all still working, everything is all good. Ripley's going to be joining us today for the durability test. I have to fill that with water, so you might want to move. Also, I don't have a plug, so I'll just stick that in there as usual, and we'll just fill this up. So I'll go ahead and play BFG Division, crank it all the way up. The sink is just base now. So it now says that I'm offline. I had Wi-Fi connected and putting it in the sink says I'm offline. So Wi-Fi does not work now. Well, the keypad doesn't work underwater. The yeah, touchscreen doesn't work at all. So nothing works. Probably the side buttons will work, but keyboard and touchscreen aren't working at the moment. I can start to hear the speaker go a little bit iffy. Oh yeah. That's got a lot of water in it now. Always still functioning. It's just BFG Division isn't sounding quite happy at the moment. Submerging it in water. 
it's fine. It's IP67 certified, so there was going to be no issues there. But now, drop test time. As I said, I'm only going to do three drops. I'm going to drop it from about sink height, which is about 1.25 meters up. And I'll do three drops only. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so instead of me dropping it from here onto the ground, I've got it on the bench, and I'm just gonna push it off, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Ripley, you might wanna move out of the way. First drop. Okay, all looking good still. All right, I'll go screen down. Still all fine, last one. I'll do it like I'm trying to cook something and I'm holding it in my hands and it sort of just falls out of my hands like that. I would say it would be no problem. If you did see, it just bounces because of this rubber case that goes around it. So I'd say that it would have a pretty high chance of surviving a couple of drops. Depending on the drop, you may shatter the glass in one go, or it may just keep on going. But for those three drops that I did just then, it's all good. Everything is all still working. I'm more than happy with that. Let's tear this down, take a look at the innards, and conclude this video. All right, well, that was the very quick durability test for the Unihertz Titan. I'm fairly sure it's going to be fine. As I said, it just bounces around when you drop it. But then again, you could drop it and it could shatter the screen. Who knows? But at this point in time, I'm happy that we've dropped it three times. It's all good and everything is still functioning perfectly fine. So we're gonna go ahead and tear this apart and see what the innards are like. We only do have four screws on the back, but then we do have these side metal rails, which I'll take all the screws out and see if we can pop it open. The only bit of damage that I have noticed is just um, where the sim tray is, just that little nick there. Don't know how that would have happened, but it's happened. So I'll just start removing screws and hope for the best. So if I tear this down and then put it back together and it still all works, that's going to be something rare for rugged devices on this channel because majority of the time I have to break the screen in order to get inside of it. But this time it looks like it's just all screws that we've got to take out. So there's the metal buttons as well as the metal rail on the side. There's a whole bunch of other screws going along there like so. I just want to see what the uh, the battery is and if there's any cooling in here. It's going to be very interesting to see the innards of this, that's for sure. Alright, it says SIM right there. So now that I've taken them off, there's six Phillips head screws on each side. With all those screws being removed, I can just pop the back off. It comes off like so. So taking a look at the back panel, there is our wireless charging pad as well as NFC. This big, huge piece right there, as well as our speaker which is this pretty beefy unit just here. Uh, we've got a tiny, tiny little vibration motor though. Really, really itty bitty small one, but it did work though. But that is the rear casing, this big piece of plastic as well as a rubber coating on there. And it does have quite a bit of weight to it, probably due to the metal bits here and there. So now we can have a look at the battery, which does say that it is a 6,000 milliamp hour battery, which is what they said on the website anyways. Just that the power profile said uh, 6230, I think it was. All right, unscrewing all the screws, we could take off this piece, which has the dual tone LED flash attached to it. That is the motherboard right there. So the side buttons are connected like so. Our keyboard cable and USB connector are on the same ribbon there. Our battery and our display ribbon. Unihertz has put some magical pull tabs in here, which should make this battery removal fairly easy. Not really. I might actually leave the battery installed and as much as I would have loved to have pulled the keyboard out, I have a feeling it might be a little bit difficult because this USB-C port has this flex ribbon connected to that, which is then filled with this glue sort of thing for the waterproofing. So it might be a little bit difficult to pull it out in one piece. So I'm gonna just leave it. What I'm gonna do is just pull the motherboard off and we'll take a look at that. That just comes off like so. No thermal paste, no nothing. The metal frame is fairly thick anyway, so that's more than enough to keep the Helio P60 cool. I thought this was a bit of a heatsink there, but no, that's just for the display. There's the earpiece as well at the top, our headphone jack, and the sensor array. The Helio P60 would be located just under there. Our front camera is this little guy. There is a sticker on the motherboard just there, which has a bunch of marks on it. Can I see anything that might tell me anything 
Not really. And the rear camera is just the 16 megapixel one. No optical image stabilization, but it does have EIS, as well as the front camera, which does have EIS. Well, look, that really wasn't that complicated to tear apart. It's just, as I said, the keyboard might be a little bit more complicated to pull that out and stuff. But I think you all get the general idea of what is inside the Unihertz Titan. I have seen no traces of water inside of this, only just on the outside. So it's definitely done its job. So I'm going to go ahead and put this all back together. Hope it still works. And we're very close to finishing this video off. All right, well, here it is. It's all back together. It's all working, which I'm very happy with. The speaker is also free of any water. I did take it apart and there was a little bit of water still left in there, but it's back to sounding nice and clear again. Also, I did notice that I have damaged the metal rail when I dropped it, as well as the sim tray area. But apart from that though, it's still in fantastic condition. Now, while I've done a mini conclusion on this, I just want to talk a little bit more about this device. For the price it's at, it's not a bad deal, especially if you're trying to look for a BlackBerry device like a key two just for the physical keyboard. You have this. It's rugged, it's heavy, it has MediaTek, but it's got the keyboard. If you want a smaller version of this, that's a bit more practical than the Unihertz Titan Pocket is $299 US dollars, and maybe a better bet if you want something that's not as big as, well, this. While the specifications aren't top tier, what this has is more than enough. I just wish this had a Snapdragon processor in it. Unfortunately, it is what it is. Performance for this was quite good to be fairly honest. User interface with this aspect ratio was easy to use for the most part, and the keyboard is definitely the highlight of this. If you can get over the weird placement of the shift and alt keys, then you'll have no problems with this. Some slight downsides are having to go into the rotation control again and again for apps to try and force them to be in portrait or however you want them. There are a couple of little fiddly things with the user interface, but nothing too bad. Battery wise, taking four hours, even though it has 18 watt fast charging, still is a bit off for me. But as I said, just charge it when you go to bed and I don't think you'll have any problems. Besides the battery life in this is absolutely exceptional. So you shouldn't run into any troubles. Also while gaming was fine for the most part on this, a lot of the game will be cropped out due to the aspect ratio. Not a negative, but it may be annoying for some. And really you can buy so many rugged devices on the market that have better specs than this and also cheaper. But the main selling point is this the keyboard. So if that's what you want, then this one is for you. If you don't need the keyboard, there are options from Doji, Blackview, AGM, and there's a lot more other brands out there that are rugged and are certified for most environments. It just all comes down to the user preference at the end of the day. I really like this phone. I think you all know that. It's not perfect, but for what it is, and if you get used to the keyboard, it makes for a pretty decent phone. Too bad there isn't 5G, but maybe Unihertz is working on one. And that is it everyone. That is my complete comprehensive review on the Unihertz Titan. I hope I've covered absolutely everything that I needed to within this review as both a consumer and a reviewer. If I've missed anything, please let me know and I'm happy to answer any questions as this is still functional, so I can go back and check anything if I need to. After this video, I'll keep playing around with it a bit more, try some other emulation and see how I go. I can always put an update in the comments below. If you also made it to the end without using the timestamps, then you are an absolute true champion. But if you use them, that's okay. They are there for your convenience. Otherwise, a massive thank you to Banggood for sending this sample out to me for review. I really do appreciate it. And if you do want to check out this phone, there are links down in the description below. They are affiliate links, and I'll earn a small percentage of a commission for any sales of this device. But there is no obligations to click them. You can go to Google, as I said. There is also a link directly to Unihertz themselves, where the phone is actually cheaper. So I'll we'll leave that up to you. And this is also part of Banggood's Black Friday sales. Those links are also down in the description below. Those aren't affiliate links, though. So feel free to take a look at their deals if you want. You might find something interesting. And I'll also clarify once again that I was not paid anything for doing this review. The sample was simply sent out to me for review and that's what I have done. All right, everyone, that is going to wrap up this in-depth review. This took a lot of time and effort, but it's finally done. So thank you very much to everyone who watched this. I always appreciate it. And I really do hope I have done a complete in-depth review of this device. Even though it's been out for two years, I'm sure you will appreciate it. Thank you so much once again, everyone. I really do appreciate it. And as always, please take care, stay safe, and be good people, and I'll see you all in the next one, which will be probably another in-depth phone review, so another one hour plus video from me. Take care in the meantime, and I'll see you in the next one. If you like this content, feel free to leave a like or a dislike if you didn't. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next video.